Um, so just to introduce to you how we're going to do the panel discussion. Uh, so we've asked a few of our uh, crew group champions to represent. Oh, it's my video not on. There we go. My video on? Yep. Thank you. Um, so we've asked a few of our <coughs> Uh, crew champions uh, to represent on the panel discussion group. And so how are we going to do it? As I'm just going to introduce the panel members. Um, and then we have three questions that we'll be asking. And it relates to the work that we do as crew. And um, this session, the, the aim behind the session is really for us to share the lessons and some of the um, tips and tricks that we've learned over the years. Um, and share that with everyone. And, and the reason why we've um, decided to do this panel discussion is also that there's a lot of uh, new crew members that have joined this meeting. Um, and so it's great for them to also learn from the experienced groups that have been doing this for a long time um, to see what they've, um, what processes they've come up with and how they deal with um, doing crew work uh, in their particular areas. Um, so we will pose three questions. I'll get to the questions a little bit later. But just to introduce the panel, so we have Tros van der Merwe, he's from the PSG in Mapumalanga. Um, we have Arista Puerta, she's from Gauteng Crew. Um, then Alison Young, she's from the Midlands Crew Group. Graham Grieve, uh, the Redatus Rangers. Sounds like a quite exciting um, superhero group there. Um, then Kara Logi, she's from the FPG in St. Francis. <coughs> uh, Jenny Potkita um, from the Atramps. Uh, Karina Lochner from Martin Tots Holland Crew. Uh, and then we have Magrit Brunk uh, and or Jenny Parsons, uh, depending on baby Emily. We'll, we'll see who will speak. Hopefully she, um, she sleeps through the meeting. Um, and then lastly, we have Petra Pradol from the Friends of Tigerberg and Friends of uh, Blava Conservation Area. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Um, and so I will do this. I'll put up the first question. Um, and then we'll ask the panel members um, to provide the input. And I will just call on the panel member and then you can switch on your mic and your video um, and you can speak. Um, and so we'll give all the panel members an opportunity to talk and then we'll have an open session where we can ask some questions and we can have an engaging discussion. So let me just share the questions. <coughs> okay, so, so can you see my screen? Just put it on sheet on full. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm worried that I can't see what's happening in the in the um, participants in the chat. Okay. So, uh, we'll so can both. I just call out the name and then Rupert, you can either unmute them or get them to talk. I will I will pin them, Ishmael. So okay, cool. and then, then they'll be on screen with you. Right. So Thank would you want first? Um, okay, so, so, so the first question for the panel discussion is how is your group using iNaturalist? And please share some of the tips and tricks that you have um, that you, either your group or individuals within your group is using to make um, iNaturalist uh, observations efficient. Okay, so first up is Truas van der Merwe. Hello all, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay. And I see you now also. As oh, so you see me, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, your iNaturalist is for us, um, there's only a few of us that use this iNaturalist really. Uh, most of the members use iNaturalist only as an identification tool for species that they cannot identify. So it's a means for people to um, get to know what species they are looking at and stuff like that. So this not many of us that use iNaturalist extensively. So, um, but it is a slow process. And as time goes by, there's more and more people 
becoming acquainted with iNaturalist. Um, I remember Tony Rebello, I think it was about three years ago, came to introduce the concept of iNaturalist to us. Um, yeah, and ever since that, yeah, it's been a slow process uh, for all of the members to use iNaturalist. So most of the members still, um, it's still a foreign concept for them. and. Uh, yeah, most of the older members also find it a little bit difficult and intimidating to to use the system. But as time goes on, we try to show them and you know, try them try to learn to help them to learn to use the system. So yeah, that's that's yeah. So it's yeah. That's what yeah. That's what I can say. Okay. Thanks, Drus. Um, Arista. Hi, can you hear me and yes. see me? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so um, I love I love using iNaturalist. I find it really user friendly and efficient, and I love how it helps you to ID ID plants and and animals that you observe while you're out in the field. Um, so I use it not only to record our observations that we make in the field, but also to look for possible locations of target species. So when I'm planning a field trip um, or so, I just go into INAT and I also use iSpot um, because it's similar. And I search for the species and look for areas where other people have found them or um, plants that they thought could be could be there. Maybe the plant was not in flower or something like that. So I really find it useful um, looking for localities for this species. And then um, a lot of our active members are also using iNaturalist. Um, a few of them are still, um, still catching on. Um, we all follow each other on iNat and we get our updates from the observations. And that way, um, our members can contribute in their own time in between field trips, especially with COVID and everything that's made field trips difficult to organize. It's nice that, you know, they can contribute in their own time just by uploading species. Then um, another fun application of iNaturalist is events like the City Nature Challenge and the Great Southern Bioblitz. So we took part um, in the Chuane City Nature Challenge this year for the first time. Um, and I think it was a great initiative. And um, for the Great Southern Bioblitz that's coming up, both Johannesburg and Chuane will be taking part. Um, so we will split up into different teams um, for the Gauteng crew. So yeah, um, otherwise I'm actually still quite new to the platform. I only joined this year. Mm -hmm. So I'm still looking forward to hearing some tips and tricks from other people. Um, Cause there's still a few things I'm struggling with. For example, like um, I would like to combine all the observations from our crew members, especially for specific trips. So if I want to see how many species did we observe for this, um, for this field trip, um, I'm not sure how to like group them all together. Should I start a, a project or is there a simpler way that I can do that just by adding a label or something like that? And then um, another thing I'm struggling with is um, I use a DSLR camera to take photos. Um, so um, just adding a location to my observations is a bit um, not difficult, just it takes some time, especially when I have a lot of observations. And I was just wondering if anyone had tips on how to do this more efficiently. Cool. I'm, I'm sure you'll get some answers, Arista. Thanks. Um, <laughs> as, as people come through. Um, I'm also just making notes of the of some of the questions so that you know if if it doesn't come through from the panel members, we can we can address some of those at the end <coughs> of the session. Great, thank you. Um, all right. So um, next up is Alison Young. Hello. Good evening. Um, yeah, we we have. A couple of members who use INAT extensively, and um, fortunately, KZN has a has a very um, we don't have a lot of people 
loading stuff onto I, um, INAT. And a lot of, um, so a lot of rare stuff isn't on, on the platform yet. But yeah, we, um, so it's not necessarily anything to do with um, age, <laughs> but the young people do contribute more. Um, load up, they aren't afraid to load up a lot of photographs. Um, the older members tend to um, be more thorough um, with looking at more details in the rarer stuff, which is really great for IDs. I struggle to get IDs on some plants um, because there's not enough information out there. Um, yeah, otherwise, mm. um, I don't use INAP much to, to find stuff. I, I haven't found that successful where the, in, the, in the places that I um, visit. But I do um, load up a lot of INAP pictures for landowners. So when we go do species surveys on um, sites that are up for stewardship, then I would load um, all the, the mm. photographs that I take onto their, yeah, so that they can look at them. Yeah. And I've introduced some of landowners to INAT and mm. tried to encourage them to use it. And there, there are a few who, who certainly where I live, there, there's um, people doing walks in the area and you can see that where they've walked and taken photographs and they load everything on, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, what else? No, oh, that's that's about it. Cool. Okay, Thank fantastic. You. Thank you, Alison. Thank okay, you. next up is Graham Grieve. Is Graham in the meeting? Sorry, there yep. we go. Can you hear me now? There we go. Yeah, yeah, we can oh. hear you. Okay. You can put in your camera too, Graham, if, if you uh, where do I do that? Um, right next okay, time. yep, yep, I see it, right. Can you see me? <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, okay, um, I used to be a fairly avid uh, iSpot uh, contributor right up front, uh, but I became somewhat disillusioned with it uh, later when they moved uh, hosting and it became a lot more difficult to post stuff. Uh, so I dropped it for several years. And it was only recently when um, the uh, Bioblitz, City uh, Bioblitz came up that uh, I, I started again. And I found, I must admit, the iNaturalist pro platform is a much easier and uh, more useful platform to use. So what I've been doing now over the last um, several months is working my way backwards through all the photographs. I, I take photographs anyway. Uh, the fact that they haven't gone on to uh, the web is irrelevant, but uh, I'm now capturing all those into INAT and um, you know, it'll take me probably another year or two to uh, get, get all my way through them. So there are a lot of good uh, observations lurking there still, but uh, um, I'm, I'm actually quite enjoying uh, the uh, discipline of putting them back into, uh, you know, making them available for other people to use. So, um, uh, I, you know, it, it's I, what I find uh, useful when, when you do an outing, uh, and it's usually just Kate and myself, um, you know, well, I'll, I'll come back, I'll process my photographs, um, and then post them to, uh, to INAT, and I usually do batches uh, of about um, 8 to 12 at a time, and, uh, and then push them through. Uh, so typically for an outing, I would have uh, 30 to 40 observations. And um, I tend to, to have a, a blanket uh, locality for the outing. So I will take a, a centroid of the, uh, the place that we visited and, and have a circle of about two, 300 meters. Uh, and that typically is what I use for the location. Um, most of the stuff that I'm submitting is, in, is relatively common anyway. So, uh, you know, I don't feel too concerned about it not being exactly the right spot. Uh, when I do get um, more specific uh, detail is when uh, the, the things that are going to be on red list uh, will be concerned, you know, then I would add a little bit more detail just to uh, provide that uh, for the mapping purposes later. Um, you know, the, the issue of dropping photographs in is now a hell of a lot more simple than it used to be in iSpot. 
Um, what I like about it, and, and I haven't yet managed to work out whether uh, it's, it's my labeling that the, the photographs have, or whether it's the um, AI in, in INAT that uh, does it, but it seems to pick up uh, a large proportion of the photographs that I drop in uh, and label them correctly, um, which I find is a really useful feature. And it, it probably helps people with, with less experience uh, in the field to identify species. So I think it's it's actually a very good uh, app uh, to use. Uh, I tend not to use uh, the the photograph uh, facility on my camera, um, on my uh, phone rather. I take cameras out to the field with me. I don't use the uh, um, GPS in my cameras. I actually find the location on, on Google Earth subsequently, uh, and I'm reasonably familiar with the locations anyway. So it's not difficult to find exactly where I was. Mm. And um, but when we do find a species of conservation concern, typically we're taking a specimen for uh, herbarium uses, uh, and then we do get a specific GPS reading for that particular location. So, uh, you know, I think those are the, the sorts of things that I can contribute. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Graham. Um, I, I just wanted to mention before I forget that we, in the Redless East Africa project, there is also a space to put your collection number so that you can also keep track of um, the specimens that you've collected and associate them with the photo that you posted. Yeah, no, I'm aware of that. Thanks. Uh, you know, it's not always that we take a specimen, but uh, uh, where we do, that information is provided. Wonderful. Thanks, Graham. Um, okay, next up is Kara Logi. Have I clicked all the right buttons? Can you hear me? We can hear you. And do you want to see me? See. Can you what? see me? Well, we can see some of you. Yeah, we can see your forehead, Carol. <laughs> Maybe just move it slightly lower. <laughs> it's a very nice coat here that I can see anyway. Um, right. Well, I actually go, go along with the, the, the first speaker. Was it Trus van Yeah. Most of our group are elderly. We slow at things like internet. And in fact, I sometimes put it down to the fact that um, our internet um, provider or whatever you say is not very fast and I get quite frustrated when things don't go as quickly as I might like them to go on INAT, but it's probably the internet, the speed of the internet and, and my age. But um, there are about half a dozen of our group that do make use of INAT to help with identifications, to check things out, um, to put, not many are putting it on crew contributors, but our younger people like Greg and Desiree Darling, they certainly have been all over the country chasing orchids and you just need to look at crew contributors and see what they've put on, outstanding photographs. But basically, I haven't got any tips or tricks or anything of that sort. I'm listening very carefully to hear what these other tricks and tips are. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> I'm sure you'll pick up some, some nice tips and tricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so next, next up is uh, Jenny Pothita from the Artrams group. Okay, is that all right? There we go, we see you. Okay, Ishmael, hello everybody. Um, I'm from Oak Tramps uh, crew group from the Southern Cape, from George. Um, we've been using INAT as a group from the very beginning. We first started with iSpot and then moved across to INAT. We, I think, all addicted to it. I seem to spend my whole day do, <laughs> excuse me, doing it. Um, <laughs> We, I know this sounds a little bit autocratic, but we've made it compulsory for people that join our group, that want to join our group, to use our net. Mm. So they've got to have some ability. They've got to come with a decent camera, with a GPS, and, and they've got to use our net. So when we have a, um, an outing, a field outing, everybody goes home and uploads all their pictures. We have a group, a, a project, 
which is called the OTRAMS Crew Group Project. So all the postings go onto the project. So it makes it very easy for us to see what each other has posted and, and help with the IDs and that sort of thing. So that's, it's a nice easy way to find everybody else in our group. At present, we have over 113,000 113, observations on our group. Um, a couple of, of tricks, of, let me just say places. For us, places have been incredibly useful. Before Tony put a stop to us, we've been creating places. So we go to an area and we come home and we create a place, not every single time, but the places that we go to often. And so we can use that place to go and prepare for an outing to the same place. You can see what we posted last time or all the previous times, so it refreshes our memories. And um, if it's a landowner, we have the link, which is very easy to send to the landowner and say, okay, this is what we found on your property. So we find places very useful. But now that we've been sort of stopped a bit, the other thing that we'd use is a bounding box. I'm sure uh, some of you will know about a bounding box. If not, Tony will help. <laughs> Um, just a few tricks. Um, I found that within our group, some people were still posting one picture at a time, one observation at a time, which was taking them all day. So bulk uploading, as I think Mr. Greve said, is, is very, very useful. I, I upload about maybe 30 at a time. And while you are there, before you actually press go, you can add the habitat, which is very important and you can add your location accuracy, which is also very important. Once you've, and you've got all your names, then you, then you, you load it up in one shot and it, it just makes everything go much, much faster. Um, the other thing we use a lot is the explore um, thing to, to, to look up what, you know, to look up uh, uh, various, um, plants that we want to find out about. So we use explore and we use the filter. The lady who wanted to know how to, to, to find all her group, use your filter and put the date in the exact date that your group went out and you will find that you will get all the postings from that day for your group if you put your group's name in as well. Um, I think that's a suggestion was made by, by Sandra this morning, and I think it's actually quite good um, that when you use the compare, the, the, the artificial intelligence, if you get an ID from that, it might be useful to make a note that you've used compare. Because sometimes we find new members have come up with these wonderful IDs and we think, hell, how did that happen? And, and it, it, they've used the compare button that might not be correct. It's just an idea. And I think it's actually quite a good idea. Uh, the other thing is most of the members of our group own an Olympus Tough camera, which has got a GPS on it and it does wonderful close-ups. If any of you have ever seen Nikki's postings, she's the one who started the trend. Okay, and I'm not get a, getting a commission. Um, <laughs> Or well, maybe a lump yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I think that's me done. Thanks, Israel. Great. Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> yeah. And and we can later later when we have the interactive discussion, we can <clears throat> you know, we can post questions to Jenny and and, and to all the other speakers and, and get more information about these wonderful tips and tricks. Okay, so next up is Karina Lochner, and she's from the Art and Touch Island crew. Is it right? Can you hear me? Yes, here we go. We can hear you and see you. Uh, yes, Houghton Dots Holland. Um, we're a small group, um, small active group, actually quite a large group, but very few active people. Um, I find that um, when we go out, uh, I, I normally give uh, the other members uh, a tag uh, this is basically an answer to one of the questions. Um, I add a tag to each outing 
um, our tag would be like um, crew HH date and the site. Um, and if we add that tag to all of the observations for that specific day, it's very really nice for someone else. And I can, I can send that tag to someone else and you can actually see what, what was seen on that specific day. Mm. Um, I also find that um, duplicates aren't really a problem. I don't think it's a problem for anyone. So I just ask everybody to upload what they can. Um, and then what else? Okay, it's, it's important to, to, um, to join the Red List project. Um, I think Ismail spoke enough about that yesterday. Um, okay, and then the question about the uh, DSLR photographs. I also use a, a, a large camera. Um, what I do is when it's something specific and I want that location, I use my cell phone for that. And then in the end, I link my cell phone photos and I, I upload cell phone photos for, for locations and then add details from the larger camera, um, close-ups and stuff where I need details. Um, but I think um, Magrit will probably have a lot of, um, have something to say about that because of it, there's a very good app um, where you can link all your photographs to the trail that you've walked, which I think is fantastic, but I haven't been able to, to do that yet. But the younger people know exactly how to do that. So I think speak to Mahrit about that. Um, I think that is my, what I have to say. <laughs> on, on, on um, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Karina. Okay, so next is uh, Magrit. If, if Magrit is available. Oh! oh. <laughs> hey, <dude. laughs> I'm going to um, have to give it over to Jenny, but I just wanted to say hi, and I absolutely love Aina. And, um, I take photos with a big camera and Jenny takes photos with a cell phone and I use the um, the PC version of iNAT and Jenny uses the cell phone version only. And in the end, Jenny is able to put up so many more um, observations than I am because she just, she's out in the field with her phone, she takes the pictures and in the evening by the television, she, she puts them on the, um, on the app which I think works very well for her. So I can actually <laughs> recommend um, from my personal experience that a, a camera is wonderful and it's, it's nice to take beautiful pictures, but look, it's time consuming. Um, so if anybody has any tips about uh, making magic time, then that would be great. Bakhri, uh, before you go, can you just share the name of that app that you use for tracking, for um, doing the track on your phone? Um, I use um, View Ranger at the moment, and I, all it does is I, I put on my location setting on my phone, and then it tracks the it tracks the, the everywhere where we go um, with the phone. And then um, in the evening, I am able to merge that with my photos. But I use Lightroom for my photos, and I know that that's it's a paid app, so that's not something that everyone can can afford. But you can also, on the View Ranger website, you can load your photos on there and then it uses the timestamp to, um, to merge the location data with the, um, with the photos. It's, yeah, it's brilliant. Okay. Well, there is an app, GeoSetter, um, mm -hmm. that's free that you can download that can also do that where it matches the track to the, to the photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of... Uh, um, crew training courses that needs to happen after yeah. this. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Magrit. Thank and, you. Uh, and thanks to Emily for, for gracing us with her presence. That, she was screaming a second ago, so <laughs> I'm <laughs> terrified that she's going to start screaming again now. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I don't so know shall if we add? add anything. Um, okay, so Jenny, do you want to... Just put on your video and your mic, and maybe you can tell us a bit about how you use the app. Okay. 
Okay, is Jenny there? Is Jenny in the in the meeting? I saw Ishmael, yeah, she's there. Um, Jenny, your sounds are coming through for some reason. Maybe take off your headphones and 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 use the. Is that better? Yeah, there, there we go. go. <laughs> is that right. better? Yeah, we hear you. Okay, so um, um, so I I got involved with the the app because as a bird I liked around a huge big lens. And when I'm trying to walk my dogs, a big lens just doesn't um, work. But a phone, uh, my iPhone in my pocket was fantastic. Um, so it meant I could take regular photographs um, at regular places, especially after the fire. Uh, I visited three locations on, a, on a, a weekly basis, two or three times a week. And it was just interesting to follow the what happened in the year, the first year after the fire. Um, it's very easy to use the app, but I don't know the intricacies of the, the desktop. And I think like everything, you should know the building blocks um, of the whole, the whole product rather than just the easy um, app version. So I, I would very much like to do another course. I did do one with Gigi um, on internet. And because Mahrit certainly shows me things and the bounding block, um, which you know, if you only use an app, you're not aware of. Um, I also appreciated um, the input from other internet folk when I'm going wrong, they put, pull me back on course. Um, Tony's helped me. Um, I mean, it's really a, 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 a wonderful community on INET that wants to share knowledge. So while it's intimidating on one hand, especially when you make a very obvious mistake, um, I find that it's very uplifting that people are eager for you to learn and they eager to share their knowledge. So. I highly recommend everyone try and get um, into INET and possibly um, more INET courses would go a long way to encouraging people to join up with crew. Because I think um, initially it's just very overwhelming um, to be able to identify flowers, number one. And number two, then you go onto INET and it comes up with weird and wonderful things and you've got no idea what you're looking at. And three, as you get the experience and you learn how to filter and understand what you're looking at, it, it all comes together. So um, my theory is that the more you use the app, the more familiar it becomes and then the easier the process and your learning is uh, exponential. Um, mm. So that would be my advice. But um, having said that, Makrita has certainly shown me lots of things um, so we work well together. Uh, I think that's that's quite an, a crucial aspect. Thanks. Cool. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, okay, and then lastly, we have Petra. I'm the friends of Tiger Bug Eels and friends of BCA. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Hey. Tigerberg Hills and Bloberg, it's in the city of Cape Town for those people from further afield. Um, so uh, we're a, a smaller group um, and only about half of the people in our group use iNaturalist actively. Um, but I'm still having problems actually getting people to uh, join the Red List um, project. So I seem to be the only one actually adding the Red List things. Um, I have a, I have two tips that I want to share with people today. Um, and, um, the, it's this, it was previously mentioned the explore, uh, using the explore, uh, tab at the top of the screen. And then you can, um, obviously you can select the place, you can select place and then, uh, projects. And for example, uh, you could select the South African red list project. So then all the red list species in a particular place can come up. Um, but the main tip that I wanted to share is that on the bottom right hand side of that screen on the filter, when you're on the filter before you've clicked search, there is actually an option to download that list. 
uh, which is extremely helpful because I kept clicking on search and then I'm on that page with all the, the default uh, pictures and then I can't print it. And I, I did, couldn't figure out how to print the, the list of what's on the site. But bottom lower right hand corner in very in small print, it says um, print. You can down well, you can get download. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, for measuring um, distances and areas that you've walked, I use uh, Cape Farm Mapper. It's only available for the Western Cape, really. Uh, it's Cape Farm Mapper, and it comes from Elsenburg, University of Stellenbosch. Uh, it's developed by the Western Cape government as well. Uh, and from there, it's really good, very good. To, uh, I use it for the vegetation types to look for other areas. So the uh, other way that I use um, INET, which is quite useful, is to actually look for uh, flowering times because the flowering times can be quite vague or fairly broad in uh, um, Cape plants. Um, so I do use it for that as well. And then the second tip that I wanted to share was uh, when you use the compare tool. Um, in so when you've got your uh, when you've uploaded your image and you've got a name on on the screen or the, the genus and you can compare. If you go to that compare screen, you can then again select um, the place. So you can say City of Cape Town or you can say Overberg. And then if you've got like a daisy and you have absolutely an asterisk and you have no idea where it is, you can on that same, uh, that second page select for taxonomy as well. And so at that way, you can jump through a vast section of the daisies because you know it's not certain things, you know it's not. So you can, you can narrow it down quite quickly uh, using by selecting the taxonomy because usually the, the, the images that you see in the compare tool are, uh, the they put the most the ones that have been recorded the most at the top and obviously the one you've seen is the one that's infrequently seen so it's going to be right at the bottom so you're going to be um, crazy by the time you get to the bottom of the list so that's what i have to say those yeah but with, but i have to say that it's very it is overall it's really hard getting people to use our naturalist uh, beyond the app and just basically uploading it because uploading it's not really difficult it's it's the next steps that people uh, it's difficult to get people to do that okay thanks cool thank you very much petra right okay so now we'll open the floor to um to any questions or queries for the panel members so how you do this is that if you go down to the reactions, if you click on that, there's a button that says raise hand. So you just raise your hand and then we'll ask you to, to ask your question and you switch on your <coughs> switch on your mic if you have any questions for the panel. Ishmael, um, we're also just going to run the poll quickly. Okay. Yeah, so just uh, for everyone's information, we trying to get some sort of feeling of, of Botsock and crew involvement. So this is just like a one-off. So if, if you could just answer the first uh, the two questions. Thank you. Okay, continue, Ishmael. Right, I don't see any hands. Maybe move on to the next round of questions while okay. it's going. Um, and people obviously have the chance next time around. Okay. Oh, there's, there's a hand from uh, Petra. Pet Petra, you got a hand up. <coughs> yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. How do we get the, um, the observations on the default in some sort of order? You know, so that you have all the Fabasi together or all the, yeah, just on the screen, because normally it's just like a Mengelmus of like different things, birds next to rats or whatever. Mm, I don't know. I think is Tony here? He maybe can answer the question. Tony, are you in the meeting? Um, yes. Um, the order is the order by commonest to rarest, the most seen to the least seen, if you're looking <coughs> at the species um, on the thing. Um, if you want it in taxonomic order, then go to the place and do the species search on the place, the checklist view. 
and that's probably the best way of doing it. But that's advanced. You're gonna to have to come on the course. <laughs> that's INET 1005. Um, right, any other questions? Okay, so I see your hand. Dai Marie. Dai Marie. Go for it. Yes, on the um, story of uh, a INAT course, we have quite a number of people who are very active on INAT, and and this is I'm from the Hermanus Botanical Society, mm -hmm. um, but there are quite a few who I think would like to also be active, but but are just hesitant, and I've tried to get them to to start using it, but. We do need a course um, and wondered if there was anything available in the foreseeable future, maybe when the, the COVID numbers are down a bit, we could possibly have something in our hall or is there a video that um, I could show to everyone because it would be really nice to get some more people on board. Yeah, so I think uh, we, we, we did discuss having uh additional videos that we can post onto our YouTube channel. Um, yeah, but I mean, this is a absolute motivation for us to, to do that so that we can kind of break it up into smaller um, little bits and pieces of information. So you can go like watch the video on how to upload an observation or watch a video how to do the filter or do the bounding box. And so I think we've, we've got a lot of suggestions tonight um, so we can look at how we can make little videos, um, just showing this like screen, um, sc um, screen videos, uh, showing you the process, and then we can post that on our, um, on our website, uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, also, um, we, we can also arrange like virtual ID courses, uh, uh, INET courses. Um, so if there are in people that are interested, um, and, and, you know, there are issues with like kind of restrictions in terms of uh, COVID, then we can try and organize a, um, a Zoom or Teams INET course. Zoom would be great. Yeah. We could, yeah, because it'd be excellent. Thanks, Ishmael. That would be wonderful. I could get a, a good group together. Okay, wonderful. Okay, we'll set it up then. Thank you. Ishmael, there's a hand from Arista. Arista, go for it. Hi, uh, yes, just um, on, on the topic of, um, of a course, I was thinking um, of maybe additionally something simpler, like um, Tony shared some really nice tips yesterday on his presentation. If we could even just have like um, a written piece, something that we could email to our members, which might help them um, to use INAT more easily and that might actually encourage them you know simple things like which projects they should join and um how to yeah how to use INAT for for crew purposes um that could also be very nice just as a starting because some people might not want to invest enough time to do an actual course mm -hmm. but having a simple guideline might help to get them started just a suggestion okay great Thank you very much for that, Arista. We will, we, it's noted and we will take a look into that. Uh, Sandra? Okay, am I unmuted? You're unmuted. Um, so with the OTRAMPS, we realized that training is really the way to go. And I just want to say anybody who uses INET really can teach somebody else something and people use it in different ways. And a good way to go is to choose themes. So if you want to do searches, you teach people how to do explore. You can do that very nicely on your phone. You can do it on the PC app, or you teach them to do batch uploads. Um, but don't overwhelm people. You know, Start with little steps and the people have to use it. Um, definitely needs based. Then the other thing that I just want to say is we didn't find that people during the city nature challenge here on the garden route that they were really interested in in zoom training i think people are still uncomfortable with that they'll probably watch youtube videos but we 
we're lucky because Christine has this lovely big room at her house which is well ventilated and she has an enormous old TV screen there but that means one can link it um, to your laptop with an HDMI cable and be online and do online courses and the people sit away they're socially distanced but obviously you need to work within your bubble for that. Hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Sandra. Any other hands? Okay, so I think just in the interest of time, we're just going to move on to the next question and then we can always circle back again if there's more um, IMAT questions later on. Um, so let me just share my screen again. Okay, and so we'll, we will just follow the same process as we did before. Um, okay, can you see the, okay, can you see the screen? Oops. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, yes. sorry, I, I had two windows open. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so the next question is, how has your group undertaken field work amidst the COVID restrictions? I know it's been a challenging time, but um, there might have been some, some interesting ways that you got around the restrictions and, and maybe even um, how you um, have kind of communicated and arranged um, logistics for field trips um, with your group members um, through the um, COVID uh, restriction time. Okay, so we're going to start again with the same process. So, through us, you can go. Am I there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was very difficult for us. Uh, most of the people were very scared. Um, I don't know why they were scared, but obviously it's a personal thing for most people. Um, so what we did was we sort of did it um, in a secretive sort of way. So we would, the guys that but were sort of at ease of meeting and going out, we would have, we, are, we would make a little group then and then we would go out. But it was actually a fatal time for us and we didn't really... Um, yeah, we didn't really go out and yeah, we missed out on quite a bit of field work. So uh, we were supposed to go to the Sautkansberg, we were supposed to go up onto the Blauberg, um, but all of those trips um, fell through and we only did a few um, yeah, local, we, we went to visit some local areas. So yeah, so it was actually not a good time for us to go out into the field. Um, yeah, so yeah. That's all I can say. I hope this COVID thing passes quickly and we can carry on with life again. <laughs> cool. That's Thank all I want to much. say. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, next up is Arista. Hi, so um, I don't know why my video is not working, so I'm just going to leave my picture up. Um, so yeah, COVID, COVID has been a challenge for everyone during the last 18 months. Basically, we just um, try to do the best we can, which means that we plan field trips and then some of them get cancelled, <laughs> basically. So um, I joined crew at the end of 2020. So then since then, we've had three field trips in 2021. Um, we've had to cancel and reschedule some of them due to lockdown regulations. Uh, we had a, a, a social event actually planned the beginning of the year in January to um, visit the botanical gardens in Pretoria and go see the herbarium and, you know, get to know each other and everything that that fell through completely. Um, but we, we did have three and um, we have another four field trips planned for the rest of the year. Um, 
So we'll we'll see what happens for them. And then just during our field trips, we wear masks and maintain social distancing because um, we we are outside, so social distancing is is not a problem. And um, we've had people enough people attending, so people didn't seem to be too scared or worried. Even though Gauteng is a hot spot, I think lots of people are just desperate to get out. <laughs> So that's just basically been our experience. Cool. Okay, thanks, Arista. Uh, Alison? Hello. So, yeah, um, people were um, pretty desperate to get out when we did open up. We often um, co consolidate bot sock outings and crew outings to try and get numbers. And we had some record numbers on <laughs> some of our outings because people just wanted to get out. But otherwise, during during um, hard lockdown, we had to cancel. And then um, there were times when we went out to do surveys, uh, species surveys, and then it would be two or three of us and not more. Um, so numbers were right down. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was quite a frustrating time because not being able to get out on the one hand because um, there was these nice sites that we would have been able to go to. Uh, the, w one other thing is that university students, it's, the university was quite strict about students getting out and so and um more too many people in a single vehicle and that sort of thing so uh, a lot of students couldn't go out which demotivated me well um i didn't go out because i wasn't i didn't have to take students out which is a good motivation if students are interested then you're very interested to get them there um yeah yeah so yeah, we didn't do too much. Cool. Right, didn't thanks. find many target things. Species. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Alison. Um, Graham. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, I want to juxtapose what we had uh, previously. We were part of the uh, Ponderland crew group uh, up until the middle of last year. Uh, and uh, that first part of the year, you know, there were some, was some reticence about going out in groups, but uh, what we tended to do was to go out in, in more cars, basically, uh, to the same spot. So we didn't lump six people into a vehicle, but, you know, limited it to three at a time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, previously, obviously, we used to travel a lot further field. So, you know, in the past, uh, I've scoffed around in Teresa's backyard, and he's done the same in my backyard. Uh, but these days, one doesn't travel so far. So uh, now that we've moved closer to Durban, uh, Kate and I are basically the Rudatus uh, Rangers group. And uh, it's just the two of us in most cases, uh, sometimes accompanied by one other person. And then, um, you know, we don't feel too restricted. And uh, we've been relatively free to go to the places that we want to go to. Uh, but we haven't traveled far afield. Uh, it, you know, that's yet to come. And I hope that um, we will feel, feel a little bit uh, freer about going and staying elsewhere and then doing a field trip to, uh, a little bit further afield. So, at, you know, we're relatively uh, unlimited, but um, much closer to home than we would have been otherwise. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Graham. Uh, Carol? Okay, I think I've got everything switched on. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can see you. Can you hear you? Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. Um, just just to get the oh, both adjusting the screen now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to get the the history uh, right. When we joined, the, um, when the FPG joined crew in two thousand and three, we were the most easterly group. Now we're in the middle. We don't know yeah. if we're in the. Um, winter rainfall area or the summer rainfall area. We basically actually, although we've had a few little showers along the coast, 
we're in the no rainfall region. Our <laughs> dams are, are critically low, and they're now talking about um, uh, water restrictions and, and so on. So the, fil the felt has been very dry. And the field work amidst the COVID has been erratic, but we've kept going whenever possible, bearing in mind, of course, that most of us are elderly and we've been very careful. We've kept in touch with our group, the FBG group, with regular articles that Bart has written with both history and botany, like, for instance, uh, the Eastern Cape's first prof professional um, botanical artist, Irma von Below, and uh, South African Christmas trees. Those were just two of the articles he did. I've sent out homework. Um, but of course nobody did attention afterwards <laughs> and quizzes to keep everybody connected on our toes and thinking bot botanically. Last year and this year we missed flowering times of some of our specials because of increase in lockdown restrictions. Just when it was time to go and look then the lockdown seemed to be worse. And we also came to a locked gate late afternoon when we were closing in on Watsonia LCI. So we lost out on that as well. Oh, I don't know what's happened now to the screen, but anyway. I you know you're me. back. Okay. We have managed to get out and help with the biodiversity assessments of various sites of varying sizes. The one surrounding the Churchill Dam is 3,400 hectares. So that's a lovely site, which soon will be declared and I've managed and we've managed to pop into Honeyville every now and then when restrictions were easier that's our first declared nature reserve we've been recording there since 2008 but still after the 13 years each time we go we find at least one species we haven't recorded before so yeah we've kept as busy as we can botanically and uh we look forward to getting out more often and having some more special plants to look for because we're not very good at climbing to the very top of Peak Formosa or the uh, sides of the Coco Dam and things of that sort. It's a little bit tricky. We don't canoe in the dam anymore. That's <laughs> oh, about all I've got to say. We'll do our best to get out. <laughs> Just let, let us know what plants to look for. <laughs> Cool, thanks. Yeah, I think that the idea of quizzes and homework is a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thanks, Carol. Okay, okay. next up is uh, Jenny Potlita from Artrams. Okay. Um, the answer to the question is with difficulty. <laughs> we cancelled field trips probably for the first time ever since I started the group uh, which was really not very nice mm. as we go out every week people have got used to being able to get out into the open so it was a, a great setback not to be able to the biggest problem was transport we've got a big group of about active 12 active members and we could no longer push mm. four people into every oh, car. Hang on, I'm a switcher. So um, we had to take many more vehicles than before, which pushed mm. up our petrol costs and our carbon footprint. Um, we also limited re new recruitment because I just didn't need to have to worry about more people and more cars and more risk. Um, so what we did was work in smaller groups. Uh, Nikki was the star of the show. She started the EFF. The EFF oh, no. is the <laughs> East End Flower Friday. <laughs> so she now takes a little group in the Nasna Brenton area out once a month, which is fantastic. Um, and then, as I say, we would break into small groups and do more local things. Um, obviously there was always very strict mask wearing in the car, but when we were in the open air, we walked free and nobody within the group ga gave anyone in the group COVID, but two members of our group have been very sick with COVID sure. and they still are. So it, it, it's very real. 
Mm. Um, I think that's about it. It's been tricky. Okay. It's been tricky. We've done what we can. Okay, wonderful. Okay, thanks, thanks. Ishmael. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, and then Karina. <clears throat> I say cook, yes. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, I can basically repeat what, what Jenny has been saying. Mm. Um, it's been tricky. Um, we've been careful, maybe I've been too careful, I don't know. Um, but at times when the restrictions weren't that strict, we, we try to get out more. Um, we depend very much on, on other people for vehicles because most of our sites are far out. Um, you require a you know, special vehicle to get there. And because we couldn't share vehicles, and for example, when we go out to Stienbras, we normally depend on, on their staff to take us out. They weren't allowed to um, take passengers. Um, so that's been a big problem. So basically we, we sort of did small outings, um, larger outings when, when the threat of COVID wasn't that great or when you felt it wasn't that great. Um, so we try to keep going, but it's been up and down and definitely not what it should have been. Um, and it's still like this, um, this year. Um, I, I feel it's, it's actually even worse this year with you know, seeing people around you getting sick. Um, so it's it's been difficult, but I'm hoping, um, I think most of us or some of us have had our second COVID shots or Pfizer shots. Um, so I think we'll be a bit more at ease in the months to come. Cool. Okay, thank you very much, Karina. Yeah. Okay, then, Rana Ida Mahrito Jenny Parsons. Jenny, are you still there? Uh, Jenny, your sound's not working again, so maybe just do what you did again <laughs> previously. No, sound's still not coming through, Jenny, from your side. Okay. Shall we move on to Petra and then we can swing back to Jenny? Okay, Petra, um, can you go? Yeah, I just wanted to um, echo um, what Karine said. We had the same issues um, with transport because several of our members don't drive. So we've always car shared in the past. Um, and also the story of actually, once you get to a site going, traveling in four by fours to the actual site where you want to be. So it has kind of limited the type of places uh, that I have arranged outings for. Um, we only started our first outings in November, so from um, March to November, we didn't have any outings. Um, I'm very cautious. Um, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I, I, uh, someone mentioned about not recruiting new people. I think that was also on our mind. We also didn't advertise to that many people when we did go out. Um, yeah, um, and on the whole, everyone's healthy. The only one person in our group is sick, but not because of any crew activity. Um, yeah, so I don't have anything else to add. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Petra. Okay, Jenny, are you up again? Sorry about that, chaps. Um, ah, there we go. Um, I can't add much more than most people have said. We haven't had too many outings. Um, we've kind of flown solo. Um, Mahrit did send out uh, one outing where we were asked to go and help 
count the population of Erika Palansi that was being poached up in the Kochelberg mm -hmm. and that was very successful. Um, we had quite a lot of feedback from members on our WhatsApp group of individual sort of outings and finds, which was great because it just kept us all um, aware that you could go walking and nature was one of the best places to be, not in a crowd and in the fresh air. So, um, but nothing formal and we're hoping to change that now. We had um, about th three weeks ago, we managed to get up to Biffle Star and we would like to um, work in conjunction with Cape Nature and um, get that site um, looked at. But um, yeah, I, th I think COVID's been tricky um, and hopefully in the, the, the next year to come, it will all settle down a bit. Thanks. Cool. Cool, thank you very much. Um, okay, I think what we're gonna do is just move on to the next question. Um, and then we can do a, um, a question answer session after that. Um, so the next question, um, and I think this is important one, and, and I think you can kind of talk about, or, or at least the champions can talk about um, kind of pre-COVID um, pandemic madness. Um, and the question is, how do you recruit um, uh, new members and citizen scientists to your group? So just some kind of tips and, and uh, of how, how you engage people and kind of what, like how do you get new people into the group um, and, and what do you do to engage them? Okay, so we can start again with Truas. Okay, are we there? Um, yeah. yeah, it's difficult because it's not difficult, but um, we have on our mailing list about 150 or 160 people. So we don't always encourage new people, but through um, my INAT profile, there was so many people contacting me um, from outside and all sorts of people contacting me wanting to know more about plants and wanting to join our outings and stuff like that so i think in the new hopefully after this whole madness period um yeah we can actively let all these people that contacts us um yeah join us in our outings and and that's how we sort of can get new people a new blood going into the group because I think it's very important for new people to come into the group and for new enthusiasm to enter the group. Uh, because sometimes, um, yeah, people, sort of the our older group sort of is set in their ways and sort of, um, yeah, and they are sort of used to the way they used to do things. But um, life is a constant change. And I think if we don't change with the times, you stay behind. So... Yeah, so thankfully through iNaturalist, there's, yeah, can I say, a lot of people that, you know, try to sort of come into the group and get involved with what we are doing. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Cool. Thanks very much, Dros. Okay, Arista. <clears throat> um, so currently we have about 142 members on our mailing list. Um, but of course, uh, a much smaller percentage of that is actually um, active members. Uh, so we're more interested in, in recruiting members who are active and participate in, in field trips. So when I started as the crew champion at the end of last year, um, I just put together a flyer and then I sent it out to various universities, especially, um, you know, botany and agricultural um, departments um, and different societies. So um, societies that have um, found different members. So um, Botsock obviously um, I asked um, them to send it out to the, the local Botsock members, um, local orchid societies like the East Rand Orchid Society, the North Rand Orchid Society, um, the Wild Orchids of South Africa. I sent it out to them and asked them to distribute it to all of their members. And I actually recruited quite a few um, from there. 
um, as well as the Johannesburg Succulent Society and the High Fault Grassland Society and the Exploration Society of South Africa. So um, a lot of them often join us on our field trips. And then um, we also planning on putting up some flyers and banners at a few plant shows. So yeah. Okay, wonderful. Good, thank you very much. Okay, next up is Alison. <clears throat> Hello, um, yeah, I don't do much recruiting, active recruiting at all. Um, what I have done in the past is tag on to BOTSOC. Um, we'd have a BOTSOC table at an event and put crew stuff out because uh, it's easy to make attractive posters and stuff with crew, crew stuff. Um, but we do have a very successful um, WhatsApp group with about 60 people. I, I actually can't remember. It's a lot of people on it. And I encourage people to um, post things on to, um, I, I know some people are still intimidated. They still private message me and ask me um, what they th I think the plant is. And so, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah, I try to encourage them to use crew for this because there are a lot of really knowledgeable people in the crew group who know their areas and have learnt the plants in their particular area. So um, that the what we wanted to do was set up a BOTSOC group with BOTSOC members. But a lot of our BOTSOC members are, are members because they want to take their dogs for a walk in the gardens. So they're not terribly interested in, in plants, intensively interested in plants, which is what crew is. Um, so a lot of members join through word of mouth. Um, I do tag onto BOTSOC outings and Orchid Society outings to share transport in the past, to share transport and um, so it, it increases the number, but it hasn't really increased the number of people who want to join crew. Um, yeah, so, so certainly in the last, since COVID, I haven't actively tried to recruit people. We haven't really, yeah. Right, cool, thanks yeah. very much. Uh, Graham? Uh, thanks, John. I, yep. Uh, in the past, when we were down with the Pondo, uh, Pondoland crew group, uh, we were quite lucky that we managed to link up with some uh, tertiary level students. Uh, and they uh, you know, have been, it's been really rewarding taking them out into the field with us. Uh, is everybody seeing me, uh, Ishmael? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see you. Okay. We can All right, good. You. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we managed to keep uh, track of these students subsequently. Uh, you know, some of them have uh, managed to get jobs in universities and some of them are still looking for jobs. But uh, it's, it's great fun going out with these younger people. Uh, you know, we, we enjoy it and, uh, and we quite often learn from these students as well because of the study directions they're taking. Um, you know, they have certain aspects that they're focused on that, uh, that are new to us. So it's always, you know, it's been rewarding both ways, uh, but we don't actually go out actively recruiting. You know, we, we're a very small group here now. And uh, if anybody wants to come out with us and we can arrange transport, then fine. But otherwise we stick to ourselves. Good, great, thanks, Graham. Okay, Carol. Yeah, well, we've got uh, Margie Middleton who leads our regular monthly rambles. Um, and anybody wanting to walk in the felt for whatever reason is encouraged to come along on those rambles. And in this way, we reach the broader community and anybody wanting to join our FPG crew group is encouraged to do so. And that's been going on since about 2003. Um, I think Margie and I, both get a lot of photographs sent to us on WhatsApp from people in the community wanting to know what a plant is, 
will this tree be a good one to plant? Um, will it attract birds? Um, I, I saw this for the first time. Please tell me what it is and things of that sort. So well, they don't necessarily want to come out and they don't all want to come out and, and, and do have crew field trips with us, but they are very much interested in what's around them. A lot of the people that contact me are people who live on the links where I work. And um, I think they're too busy playing golf and bridge sometimes, but um, haven't managed to get any of them to join us. But we have had new, uh, a few new members in the last 12 months. Right. And start the Botanical Bridge Club. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thanks, Carol. <laughs> okay, Jenny, what is that? Okay, um, we've used INAT to recruit people. Guys, very good at that. Uh, you, if we see that they're in our area and they're doing a lot of work on INAT, then we approach them. Uh, we don't actively go out and recruit because we actually have enough people to cope with in terms of the transport and organization being a smaller town. Um, we also suss people out. We, some of us belong to other uh, hiking groups and then they see that somebody's interested in the plants and encourage them and eventually they join the O-Tramps group. Um, sometimes uh, part, members of the group suddenly get an, an approach from a friend they want to join and you know so it's brought in by friends and and definitely by word of mouth we we often get approached suddenly out of the blue somebody will will email and say they would like to join the group um so at, at one stage we had too many and we had to stop it because of especially because of covid um i think that's about it really yeah, that's it. Cool. Fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, Karina. Hi. Um, I, I should actually skip this one because I haven't done any active recruiting. Um, but I do speak to people whenever I see someone photographing plants or I meet someone in the field looking at plants, I tell them about normally INAT first because that's also a way to get into crew but I also tell them about crew. Um, I have contacted people through INAT uh, when I see they're in the area and they're interested and they're actually already posting pictures. So we've got quite a, a big mailing list of interested people but not that many that are coming along on, on walks. Um, yeah so and, and of course, word of mouth, I think, also uh, works. It's, you know, it's, it's normally it's word, word of mouth. People who know what we are doing and then put someone else in contact with us. Um, but I know there's a lot more we can do, but we also can't handle, you know, groups that are too big. Um, most of our sites are um, private farms. Um, other areas where we can't go in as a large group. So we, we can't drive up to some place and then go in as a group of 10. So that does limit us. So um, I think we have to look at the people who, who do join and get them to um, use INET, which is important. I think, um, you know, we, we won't force them to do that, but I think that's a, a good thing to look at if, if they're already using INET because that, that makes a big contribution. But I think there's a lot more we can do with um, recruiting. But I must also say that a workshop like this um, is very inspiring to again sort of get enthusiastic about doing the work that we should be doing. So it's, it's, it's great doing this workshop. Thanks, Ismail. Oh, thanks, Marina. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karina. Okay, um, and then Jenny Parsons. Um, Ishmael, uh, 
we haven't done any major recruitment, but Mahrit has set up a fantastic WhatsApp group, which has 39 members, but I, we have to admit that a lot of our members on that WhatsApp group are HH members, and Cape Town members, <laughs> and Stellenbosch <laughs> members, and Romanus <laughs> members. But what is nice is that it's a very knowledgeable group. So if there is an outing, it's really, I mean, I've learned an enormous amount from from the people that I've met. So it's inspirational to go out on an outing. And um, that's what I would like to explain. And when we're recruiting to people, it's not just finding a pretty flower, it's actually more than that. But um, I have a lot of queries via social media about how they can become uh, plant identifiers or fan boss um, involvement, etc. And the bottom line is not everyone is cut out to do identification and INET, etc. So you've got to try and catch the right kind of person for want of a better word. Otherwise, you spend a lot of time um, on folk that aren't really interested in habitat or importance. It's just another pretty flower or a bird or, or whatever. So that's the one aspect. The other aspect I would really like to encourage, and Mahrit and I have talked about it, is to work a bit more closely with the Kohobu Botsok um, and have a, a, a better um, partnership there um, and maybe bring um, the, the, the villages from Royal Oss, Pringle Bay, Betty's Bay and Claremont together because We've all got nature conservation groups and it would be quite nice to kind of tie us up and um, uh, and, and draw us all together. Um, because the more we work together, the more we conserve the Kuchelberg area and the, the, the flats, the, the sand flats and, and the critical biodiverse areas that surround us. So that would be a, a fantastic um, uh, a way of going about it. Um, I get inspired by the Hermanus Botanical Society. Um, they're doing awesome work in Fern Cliff. And um, yeah, I think as, as Karina said, a, a, a workshop like this makes me all fired up to go out walking tomorrow and see what I can find. So yeah, I, I think INET um, has made a big difference for me. And that's certainly the way I go when I'm talking to people. Get involved with INET and the rest will follow. Um, possibly, uh, it's just an, a, a small idea, is would you be open to having a Facebook page for the local chapters or the local groups? Because if we could promote our funds or, or our interest to on a local group, um, maybe people would, would want to join. I, I don't know, it's something that you could just think about or when we next see you, we can chat about. Um, but yes, I think uh, I think recruitment's there and I think it's important to make people realize uh, what a special country we've got and what biodiversity is out there. Thanks. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Ishmael, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just saying it's a great suggestion there from Jenny about um, forming a kind of cluster or consolidated group around the Kogelbug. Um, okay, and then lastly, uh, Petra. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I haven't specifically <coughs> done any recruiting during the uh, period of lockdown. Um, but what we do, uh, our group is linked to the local friends group. And so our friends of the Bloberg Conservation Area. So people that are interested in conservation generally uh, find their way to that organization. And then they are, they're quite often the ones who do support us uh, when we go out into the field. Um, what I also did was in the uh, newsletter that they have, I did a sort of a plant focus. Um, so it's something that people might see quite often on their walks and things like that. And then I've sort of linked it to crew activities and um, uh, encouraged people. But I have to say, I haven't had very much success doing it like that. Um, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 
a strange thing, you know, you live in a big city and um, there are lots of expenses and things like that. So how much free time people have, uh, it's quite questionable. I mean, obviously, once you get the slightly older people are retired. Um, so the, I have quite often, I do actually target that group because they at least they have at least after retirement, I think they have at least 30 years of good <laughs> quality time to give to us. Um, but I've, uh, we have had uh, two new people join us since uh, COVID though, and both of them are on INET. So, and, um, and they're with the program. So that's, that's been kind of, we, so we have had two new good members join us recently. Um, but yeah, that's all. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Petra. Wonderful. Cool. Um, all right. So. I think Rupert, do you just want to, um, before we take question, just give us the results of the poll? Sure, let me do that. So I, I think um, it's it's just interesting, you know, um, for, for the new people here who haven't been here since 2003, uh, like myself and the Logies, um, when we started out, there was quite a high BOTSOC crew overlap in terms of membership. And um, now we um, we just like to reinforce that from, from our side as well. You know, it's just to make sure that, that uh, we can continue supporting crew and get stronger. And so the cool thing for me about the poll is that it shows that there's room for improvement and um, for, for better engagement and amplification. Because uh, while we've been talking here, it's just, a, a, I mean, Jenny started it because she's got a really good um, social media footprint with uh, the Kuchelberg people. Um, and how we all together kind of amplify this more and be consistent on our, our um, platforms about things is something we've been working on quite hard at Botsock in terms of our marketing strategy and, and presence. Um, and, and I think, you know, Crew works with Botsock, Botsock works with crew. So we just want to continue uh, firming that relationship and, and making sure that uh, we can get the best outcome for, for all of us, essentially. Okay, great. Okay, thanks, Ishmael, Robert. Oh, uh, yeah. Can I just share that uh, the city of Cape Town thing quickly? Okay. Um, I just wanted to draw people's attention to to this because um, Karina didn't mention it really, but um, as of today, the the city of Cape Town put out this press release about grow, don't mow, and talking about how um, I'll put the link in the chat how. Um, they are selectively not mowing certain open spaces. Now, people on this call will know that this has been a big challenge over the years in springtime with, with public open spaces getting mowed. Um, but because of um, work from a lot of crew people and other interested citizens, there's been action. So I just wanted to show people that this is an example of sometimes, you know, it can be hard but if we just stick at, at engaging with these things, then we can um, facilitate change. So keep going. Cool. Thank you, Rupert. Um, and then we also had a request from uh, Brian um, and he asked for two minutes. So we'll give him two minutes <laughs> and only two minutes. Um, just to quickly talk about his PhD and some support that we would like from the crew network. Brian? Hi, Ismail. I think everyone can hear me. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, firstly, uh, thanks to everyone that has been contributing, uh, even if they haven't known about it, to my PhD. Uh, I'm working on revising Indigo in the in the chief CFR. And uh, it's been a major challenge with lockdown, but but INET has actually helped me in in where I've not had access to the herbarium. I've been able to look at uh, Indigo for online through photos. 
and to collect them in the field. Uh, so I'm now posting in the in the chat a link to my Indigofra project. Please join uh, the project uh, and register or uh, give me permission as an admin to, to access locations if you do hide your locations. Uh, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, one of the things that I'll be doing is I have to map the, the distributions of all, all the species and uh, do further analysis. Um, otherwise, yeah, uh, I'm glad to say that of all the, the species in the GCFR, I've collected over 90%, uh, of which uh, a couple of brand new species have also been found thanks to people posting on INAT. Yeah, and uh, one of uh, one of the, them I just want to show you what I've been doing is making my own little herbarium, and uh, this species is going to be na named after the tunnies, my outrams. Thanks, Ismail. Cool. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay, and then uh, before we take the last. Um, uh, we will use the last bit of time for questions. We just also want to um, just stress the importance of going to the Crew Contributors Project and um, joining that project on iNaturalist. Um, so, and then also if you, um, we, we add names of the crew volunteers to that project so we can track um, your observations. Um, for the crew project, but please, if you can go to that project and join join it. And then also really importantly, remember there's um, three other projects that we strongly encourage you to join. It's the Habitats Project, and then the South African Plants, uh, South African Red List Plants and Animals Project. And then there's a whole bunch of sub projects under that which you can also join. Um, and then most importantly, the Red List is Africa project. Um, and that is where you submit your very valuable data to us um, that is used for Red Listing, for conservation planning, for, for all conservation um, purposes. Um, okay, so then for the last part of the session, we are going to take um, any questions. Um, for any other panel members or for any of the crew staff related to the questions we asked. Okay, Tomatella, there's a hand. Tella, go for it. I don't think I'm not really going to ask a, ask a question. I just want to say something. Um, go for it. I, I, I just wanted to reiterate how absolutely critical it is to get your members to work on INAPLUS now. So. Klingiwe and I didn't really say this yesterday, but when we used to do red list before, we really used herbarium data, and now we use our naturalist data. It is so incredibly valuable. And so I just, I, just, I think it's important to let your groups know that, that you know, if, if, they're, if they're not posting on our naturalist, it actually makes it really, really hard for us to tell what's going on with the species. Um, and it's even the least concerned species or something that we think, like, might not yet be listed as a threatened species, but might in future be, be a threatened species. Um, if we don't have the iNaturalist data, we can't tell um, what's going on with it. And it's been quite telling for me to, to work on through the Iridaceae and just see, because Iridaceae is such a showy family, you, you know, it's probably better represented on iNaturalist than any other family, um, maybe not, maybe second after the Proteus, but it's pretty well represented on iNaturalist. Um, and you really see uh, like where where there's active people on iNaturalist, you can you get a total full picture of what's going on with the species, um, and then you get these gap areas where we don't have have um, yeah um, citizen scientists active. So so I just hope that it's like become so clear for everybody on this call, and um, for people like Tris, where you you know you've got people who've been. The plant species group that Tris is part of, <laughs> they are the oldest group. They predate crew by at least 10 or 15 years. Um, they've been going for a very, very long time. So, um, so they have, they're, 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 they're dependent completely on specimens for many, many years. Um, but times are changing. And so I'm hoping even groups like that will move 
onto using our naturalist. Um, yeah, and, and, and if anyone has like any more doubts or worries, they must actually tell us so that we can help work out what they are and, and help explain. Yeah, if you, if you need us to talk to your members about it, we can do that. Thanks. Cool, fantastic. Thank you, Tilla. Any other hands? I don't see any hands yet, Ishmael. Okay. Are there any Please. questions from yesterday's session, Ishmael? If people might still have. Yeah, I don't know if, if anybody has any questions from yesterday's session that you still would like to ask. You're welcome to, um, to ask them now. Oh, that's a clap. Um, <laughs> Jan? Jan, you're on mute. Jan, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. There we there. go. Um, yeah, just a, just a comment really on iNaturalist. Um, how secure is, is the permanence? Well, nothing's permanent, but how secure is iNet in the future? You seem, we seem to be putting all our eggs into the INAT basket. And, you know, will it be there forever? Have you got some backup to retain all the information that is currently on INAT in the event that it, uh, that it should fail for whatever reason? Political uprising, you, you mentioned it. That's my question or comment. Ishmael, I can start and then, right. okay. and then Tony can add. Tony can add. <laughs> so, so, so um, you know, the, 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 the amazing thing is that iNaturalist is, I mean, the well, useful thing is it's not South African. So um, it's run by the, the University of California. Is that right, Tony? I always yeah. forget the actual name. Yeah. Um, so, 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 they, so they have, um, and, and, it's growing constantly and they're forming communities across the world. We are still um, needing to get our community right. And I, I will hopefully be getting that right in the next few months. But um, they've got various various countries who use iNaturalist like we do, many, many. And so um, I think because there's such a global support of it that it's very unlikely to, um, to, dis to, to, to fold. And they are experiencing challenges with huge amounts of data at the moment, so they're, um, they're, they're working out how to, how to manage that. But I really see like very little chance of them folding. If it was South Africa only, or especially only in Sanby, there could be quite a high chance. And then the other important thing to know is that we get regular data dumps. So even if it does fold, the data sits with us and, and, and we've got it. So it's not, it's not lost. Tony, you better add, because you know these things in much more detail than I do. And thanks, Tilla. Um, yes, it's an international organization and it's sponsored by National Geographic and the California Academy of Sciences. Um, so it's got a reasonable good base on that. Um, remember, we got stung with iSpot, um, not funding and going slightly backwards, um, and we joined iNaturalist. And the reason why we're not a community yet is because we've been negotiating. So if something goes wrong, um, all the data from Southern Africa will actually be handed over to Sanbi as part of the um, process. So if something goes wrong with iNaturalist, Sanbi will get all our Southern African data. So that's one of the reasons why we're not yet a community, why we weren't a community about a year or two ago. Um, and we're negotiating that and it's um, something that iNaturalist hasn't dealt with neither. So we've had to experiment and find out how best to tackle that. And then if you are worried, um, if you check the bottom of the page, you can donate. Um, and there are people who are donating on a monthly, weekly, annual basis. Of course, with our exchange rate, it's not so handy that we um, help them there. Um, but um, yeah, so they're getting all around the world, they're getting donations. So they seem to be on a good fitting now. Of course, we don't know how long this will go on in the future. Um, but um, compared to some other sites, um, the Australian site, Bowerbird, that collapsed, that gone to iNaturalist. Um, iSpot, we went to iNaturalist. Um, there's quite a couple of other sites which have migrated to iNaturalist. 
So right now it's the way to go. But what the future is, mm. it's probably safer than most, but that's as good as I can say. Yeah, I, th I think also one of the valuable things about INET is that the data is available immediately. So you can, you can download information directly from the site. Other, like with iSpot, we had to wait for them to give us the data. Um, but with INAT, you know, your, whatever your data is, it's, it's available immediately. You can download it. Um, so, so, so that's also one of the advantages. Um, because, because all, all the research grade data is available via GBIF, which collects all the data from yeah. all the science projects around the world. So INAT just contributes to that. It's one of the biggest contributors which makes it very handy as well. Mm. Uh, Chris, White House. Uh, you're on mute, Chris. You're on mute. Thank you. I just want to ask about the, um, the, the bio blitz and the southern, the southern bio blitz and the city nature challenge. Um, what, what's the uh, criteria for being a, a node? on that because obviously the city of Cape Town classifies yet it covers all the peninsula and half of Hottentots Holland um so what what what's your um I mean can the overstrand the whale coast be a node what's what's your views on that um I'll tackle that so there's um two different things here the city nature challenge is supposed to be between cities so it's the municipal area as a rule so the municipality, what would you be? Overstrand um, yeah. could be a municipality and could participate. Um, but we have a few exceptions like Garden Route, which has gone slightly bigger. So I um, mean, it's flexible. Um, and then for the Great Southern Bioblitz, and there's a combination of cities, regions, provinces, and countries taking part. So on, for the Great Southern Bioblitz, you can form your own group. So that's pretty vague. It, it, you're, you're actually competing against it's flexible, each other. not vague. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so please uh, form your group and join. I mean, if, you, if you're hurry, you can still participate in the Great Southern Bioblitz. It's in October. I'll see where there's interest in the area. Yeah. <laughs> I'll speak to the branch for you, Chris. <laughs> Cool. So we've, Ishmael, we've there, there was a hand. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, there was yeah. a hand from someone, and and then it went down again. I I, I, I couldn't think it see might his have name. Been Jenny. Yeah. I saw Jenny's hand up, but then I can't see it now. Jenny, do you still want to ask a question? Yes, I did, but then I realised that Tony had sort of answered it. My question okay. was about uh, sensitive species. We know about conifers and hawthias and stuff like that. But what else should we consider sensitive species? I'm talking broadly. Can you answer that? I would say a sensitive species is one that's likely to be poached and that's likely to be collected or, or stolen or removed. So most of them will be bulbs and succulents um, and the most Vulnerable are those that take a long time to grow um, or that are collector's items. So stuff you can breed easily or that produce from seed aren't that important. But the stuff that takes you know, 10, 20, 30 years to grow to a nice plant, those are the stuff that are most prone to poaching. Um, it's probably okay. fewer than you think, but there's quite a lot, yes. So it's bulbs yeah. and succulents mainly. Perhaps we can throw in the odd um, orchid and then of course your cycads. Oh, cycads, yeah. Okay, mm. thanks, Tony. Right, great. Um, okay, so if there isn't if there isn't any more questions, I would like to just thank our uh, panelists um, for making time available and um, for <coughs> agreeing to be part of the um, uh, panel and answering questions and sharing your vast knowledge with us and all your lovely tips and tricks. Um, I think it was a really valuable session, especially for the the volunteers that are quite new to crew 
um, just getting that experience and um, knowledge transferred across to the to the other crew members. So I think it's a, a it was a really useful session. Um, and then I think the other thing before I forget, we also wanted to just throw out the idea um, and just get a sense of would people be interested in doing this kind of like kind of evening sessions where we would like kind of pick a topic. Um, uh, either it could be like very short INET training sessions um, or how to add things to group projects or that kind of thing. Um, and we can come up with a list of topics and and would uh, would a platform like this um, be useful for addressing those kind of things? Would, would people be interested in joining um, evening session, evening kind of knowledge exchange sessions like this? So I think you can you can just kind of give us an indication. Yep, in the um, a thumbs up. So you can either just say yes in the uh, in the chat box, or you can use the reactions to put a little thumbs up. I'm not seeing any no's, so. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, and then also importantly is, uh, is this time sort of a, a, a useful time, like five to seven or maybe six to seven or something like that we could try. Also, yes, according to the chat. Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Absolutely, yes, yeah. Okay, fantastic. So I think yeah, we've come just, to the end. Ishmael, just yeah, check yeah. some people are saying it's too early if you come from work. Those of us who have kids, okay. it's a really tough time. So maybe 7.30 to 8.30, so it's not too late, but you can have had your dinner before. You could have got back from work. You could have seen your kids for a few hours after work. Um, so that maybe that's just an option to think about 7.30 to 8.30. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like people like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Especially as moms. <laughs> <laughs> and dads <laughs> and dads don't, don't forget about the dads sorry <laughs> great fantastic um okay so with with that i would like to just thank everyone for your participation um and uh, the recordings will be available early next week uh, and then just a reminder we have uh, absolutely wonderful program tomorrow. We have Dr. John Manning talking about the Ida Daisy, um, and we have um, Dr. Ralph Clark um, that will also be talking about some projects, um, diversity um, monitoring in the, in the Eastern Cape. Um, so yeah, tomorrow is um, definitely a day to look forward to. I know I am. So um, without further ado, we will um, close the meeting and we will see you all tomorrow.